Welcome everybody here to the Siegel Talks at uh, the Martini Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY um, in the big city of New York, which in a way is the heart of the darkness in the, in the moment and, uh, and is broadcasting to all the metropolises and the cities of the world uh, about uh, that uh, time of Corona we, we live in and we try to find meaning and we try to listen. To, to artists' voices. We hear so much from politicians, economic advisors, and virologists, but what we really need to hear is also the artists' voices. They have been the true voices. If you look back over centuries, they were on the right side of history, on the right side of justice, the right side of progress. And this is a moment, again, a very serious, serious moment where uh, things will change, already have changed. We might not um, have seen it or we might not know about it. We are way too close. And um, here uh, we are the, perhaps the only one, and I think we are the only theater institution in New York City, perhaps even in the United States, doing daily new programming. And this is what we do here at the Siegel Center. We feel it is important to keep that up. It's also a global dialogue. Tomorrow we have people from Pakistan and uh, India. We had people from uh, artists from Lebanon, from uh, Egypt, from uh, Germany, uh, from Taiwan, Hong Kong, China. This is very important. It work of the Siegel Center, the British Academy on Professional Theater, international Americans. And the artists we talked to today also have been long friends, good friends, and we admire their work. We think their work is essential in New York City. And we have the great uh, Melanie Joseph um, with us here today, the <laughs> founder of the Foundry Theater that really early on has pointed to what is important, to what is significant celebrate life but also death and the problems we have or as Buddhists say life and art should be a joyful participation in the sorrows of life and that's what the foundry did it was a joyful participation in the sorrows of light and showed us about it and also gave us some uh, signposts where to go the great Aaron Landsman um, here is with us uh, who we invented in a way uh, also in a way the documentary theater participatory socially engaged art is an enormous contribution a unique American one also compared to the European ones of Kreuzinger and uh, Milo Rao and others and um, Orange Choir and a great playwright a great writer also for, uh, for film and television one of who is able to bridge his political mission, artistic mission, social mission, which is work, and also is successful the best we can hope for. And it makes us proud um, that uh, this uh, is actually um, is uh, happening. So um, I thought of Melanie, um, of course, for the Siegel Talks. We are on week uh, three. Next week, we're going to have Basil Jones from the great handspring company in South Africa. Richard Schaffner will talk to us. Milo Rao will be with us. Uh, Guillermo Calderon from Chile and possibly mm -hmm. from France. Arthur Ciel. The big Avignon Festival has been canceled. The greatest celebration of theater in the world has really never happened. As we mentioned earlier, the mosques are closed for the first time in a thousand years. So this is a moment. So uh, Melanie was on my mind and then she wrote an email uh, to, to her friends and colleagues. And I thought, no, really, we should have Melanie right away. So tell us a little bit. Hmm. Well, um... First of all, I'm delighted to be here and I'm especially delighted to be here with these two gentlemen who, whose work I respect mightily. Um, I was very moved and continue to be very moved by the many things that keep popping up on Facebook, uh, su uh, emergency support for artists and theaters. And of course there's not I mean, there needs to be so much more and may it continue and continue. But it makes you feel like somebody is paying attention. Somebody is, um, somebody, we didn't have to ask, we didn't have to beg like normal. And um, I, had a, I have a friend who is an undocumented uh, New Yorker who lost his job and the dead end of his, um, living experience, it was really startling to me. You know, there are, there are certainly no um, funds, emergency funds popping up from wealthy patrons and, um, and foundations and even governments for undocumented people in New York City. And I feel such a kinship, of course, with him, but also with all these freelance folks who've lost their jobs. And as Aaron pointed out to me a while back, we've many of us in the theater have worked in restaurants and um, 
many of the people who've lost their jobs have lost their restaurant jobs. So we, we do share a lot. And I thought, how can we as artists, how can our community be, be reached? Could we actually gather 1,000 people to give $15 a month for six months? Um, because it's going to be a long crisis. And I don't even know that six months is, who the hell knows? We don't know anything, do we? <laughs> but um, then I was lucky enough to be, di to be directed to um, the New York State Youth Leadership Council, which is the first undocumented youth-led organization in New York City. And they are wicked organized and organizers with programs in I think about 200 schools, they're organizing undocumented youth. And as soon as this um, pandemic began to, everybody began to lose their jobs, the, um, the organization posted an emerge, you know, applications now for an emergency fund and set about raising the emergency fund. In about four hours, they received 1500 applications. Hmm. Hmm. So they had to shut it down because they knew they, they certainly didn't have enough real money to support 1500, let alone all the ones that weren't able to exist. So I thought that's who, let's add to that, you know, because they're, they're really smart. They're incredibly smart organizers at this organization. It was founded in 2007 by a group of Hunter College students who were all undocumented. And um, they, they know that everybody pays attention to youth, undocumented youth, to dreamers and DACA and la la la, but they also know that they have aunties and parents and grandparents that they have to take care of. So they understand themselves as a source to undocumented families. And so I started this, I put up a GoFundMe campaign. Here is the address. Everybody write this down, $15 <laughs> a month until September. It's like a cocktail, right? I mean, we can, we can like, Toast, fellow New Yorkers. So here's the here's the site. It's b i h t t p s b i t dot l y forward slash paying it sideways, because I feel like these are we're paying it sideways. Um, and so far we're doing fairly well. We've uh, I think we have. Um, I'm just looking it up now just to. Oh wow more money. Um, we've raised um, $11,175 for this month of for, you know, and we're trying to get $15,000 a month. And we have 164 people have participated in, in eight days. Wow. So off we've gone. Here we are. And um, I can't say enough how moving it is to see the performing arts community stepping up in this way um, to help our fellow New Yorkers um, who have no access to anything, not to, mm. certainly not to any stimulus packages. <laughs> mm. I call this a grassroots stimulus package founded by undocumented youth, God bless them. Anyway, mm. that's what I really wanted to talk about. Thank you, thank you, Melanie. We have the uh, also website under your uh, screen image so people can uh, look at it and see that I will sign up too. <clears throat> I also tried to sign up for Taylor Max, a uh, great uh, trickle up nyc.org. Somehow I got rejected, I don't know why. My credit <laughs> card didn't work, I will try again, but who knows? Try a different credit card. It could yes, just... because I do trivial things. So I'm gonna sign up uh, on paying it sideways uh, uh, right away. Please do to everybody, especially who can, $15 a month is not asking a lot. And please put your, 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 your heads in the shoes um, of our friends and our colleagues, of the people who, who do the artistic work. Um, someone once said that even though it's an odd image, it's like the rainworms in the grass, you don't really see them, you know, but they are the one who cultivate, put air in, and they would be dead without. 
And the same thing is, you know, I think with art and theater and the city and the ones are visible, the ones are bigger and here and there. But there are also so many who work, do a work that really makes the city and life um, really what it is. And there often it isn't visible, but now we really have to step up and help. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, also, as Melanie said, a long way. Melanie, why did you think Aaron and Orange should join us? And maybe you asked them a bit a question. What, what, was the, what does their work stand for? What does their work stand for? Mm -hmm. hmm. I think you'd have to ask the audiences of that. I mean, and the participants. I, I, what I can say is that I'm attracted to their politics and the way their politics are expressed. And I'm attracted to the fact that they actually are, um, that I actually feel like I can have a conversation about raising money for undocumented people with these two gentlemen without it being a strange thing to do as an artist. Um, I just feel, um, I feel they're brothers of mine in the, in the creative community and I don't have that experience all the time um, or even as often as I wish I did. <laughs> so um, I just feel, um, that both of them are alive. Uh, their work is in the world. Their work is in the world. It engages with the world. It interrogates the world. Um, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Melanie. Before we come to them, where are you now? Where are you sitting? Um, how does your days look like? How do you experience as a person? You know, how, how do you experience everything? Where's your, where, what street you live in and, uh, and how does your day look like? Or did, what, do, what do you do? Can I hear you? I don't know. I hear you. Yeah. I think she can't hear you. Can hear me. Or maybe then let's go on to you. Or on to, um, uh, I can hear. Oh, okay. I just don't, I don't know. I mean, I just wanted somebody else to answer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay, Oren. So let's 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 come to you. And um, Melanie spoke about about your work and um, which in which way is it political? And what is this new situation we all live in now? What is it adding to it? Well, I started off as a reporter in high school, so I was used to doing budget, uh, which back then was the newspaper term for having your daily meetings and your pitching stories. Mm. So a good newspaper story always has. It's either, you know, they say bleeds or what bleeds leads, but really it's something that's provocative. And for longer investigative pieces, which is how I consider theater and film and TV, there has to be some gray in it for me to take an interest. So I recall a few years ago, I was working with a tectonics theater company on a project about converso crypto Jews, people who fled the Spanish Inquisition and settled in the Southwest of America. Uh, and I was looking for the gray area, which is a lot of these people who fled the Inquisition, held, uh, kept their Jewish identity secret, and then used their power being under the guise of the Spanish regime to suppress Native Americans and help colonize those areas. So I'm always looking for gray. And when I was finishing that project, uh, one of my collaborators said, hey, would you be interested in working on a Jena 6 project about uh, black high school students and racial discrimination. And I thought about it and I, and I said, to be honest, I don't know what the angle would be because in this case, one side in my opinion is clearly right and the other side is clearly wrong and they're <laughs> racist. So what am I watching besides me reiterating what I already know? Right. Whenever I dive into a drama or, or working on something, we're always like, what's the gray area? What's the twist? And so that's the way I write my plays, uh, the first two, brain was a political sci uh, and sci science fiction and all these things about aliens from outer space invading people's heads and making them really staunch right wing or really staunch left wing during an election year and destroying the country. And this happened in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and we released it in the summer, which was three months too early. Uh, but we were examining not just criticizing the right and Fox News, we had to find our own parallel on the other side. Uh, and then on uh, The Good Fight, the same thing at a black law firm. What are the issues that are in the gray area? Uh, and then for evil, spiritual, 
what are the issues that are gray, uh, spirituality that cause us to question ourselves. If I know the answer to something, I generally don't write it. Right. Or if I know the answer so solid that it's not even, it's, it's like, no, don't, What's the don't point? Rape, kill, don't mm -hmm. rape and kill. It's like, okay, well, that's, that, that's a what that's a tweet that's not a <laughs> right. um, mm -hmm. so, so that, what's the gray area what is the gray area now i think the gray area now is that i woke up this morning and i uh do my daily meditation and i was thinking about what i'm gonna do and i've been giving to pay it sideways i've been giving to taylor mac i'm happy to do that there is a part of me thanks to tv writing the last few years that has some extra income. And I have invested money in the stock market. So there's another part of me that clicks on, which is the baby capitalist. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible, but once you invest in the capitalist market system, you immediately think, oh my God, this is gonna hurt my investment. And then the second thought on the capitalist side is, maybe I could take advantage of this. So I began looking on my stash account saying, what should I buy? I let pharmaceutical, healthcare, all these things. So I am contributing and paying to this, donating to charities. And at the same time, there's a part of my mind that thinks, maybe I should invest in this for testing because that's going to be- But good. not pharmas, really, really, Oren, really? The pharmas that are going to be creating the vaccines that we're going to need, that are going to be distributed around the world, that billions of people are going to have to take. I'm thinking like, is that an investment? And this is just- a tiny thought, a tiny germ that balances it out. And I think that uh, as artists, our general mode is there's a crisis, let me give, which is good. It's like, let me give, how can I contribute? How can I use my creativity? And then from the capitalist angle, there's a part that thinks, oh my God, there's a crisis. Are my investments in retirement protected? Number one and number two, because I didn't grow up in a rich family. I didn't grow up with all these things. Is this protected so I can live? And then a part of me thinks, well, is there some way that I can make money so that I can kick it back into the charity? And I think that that is the icky gray area that we talk about in America because there is a difference, in my opinion, between giving and charity and philanthropy. And I do all three. Someone asked me, hey, I need $500 to put up a show. That's giving. I'll give that short. I'm not going to see any return on that. That's a one time. Or, hey, I need $500 to pay the rent. Great. Charity uh, is, hey, we've created this organization to address your needs. And that's important too. These are your needs. And then philanthropy is, how do we create a system that's sustainable, that deals with our needs? It deals with your needs, but then my needs too. And it gets rich people and capitalists who have the money to reinvest and become a sustainable system. So I'm always thinking, you know, I'm a Buddhist and I read the Diamond Cutter Sutra, which is about investments in business. They always say in Buddhism, you don't want to be a poor Buddhist. You don't want to be someone who has to rely on your parents for money, rely on this and that. You want to use your skills so that you can create a system that is sustainable because a sustainable system is able to give back to people without having to uh, mm -hmm. go around and annoy people. And then people jump on board like what Melanie's doing, like what other people are doing, Taylor Mac in the arts community, those are sustainable systems because you're dealing with the community, you've invested in the community and community is more than willing to give back. And so I'm always trying to balance those three levels of giving in charity and philanthropy. So I'm getting supplies from China and I gave away four or 500 masks two weeks ago to different doctor's offices down here. That's just, and I'm, I'm giving and all these other things. Then I'm thinking, okay, what's going to be the return so that I can get more mask down the road because this is going to last for 18 months or two years. What's going to be the system, things that are going to be... The system in a way that you'd also say you kind of help you to, to sustain yourself or others, but isn't the system also the reason why things are not not working? Yeah, um, that's I the, mean, what about area. the people? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's that's a fantastic, great, great, great that's that you answered that. That's the area of now. Yeah. That's right. That's it's the like, great area of now. 10 you years know. ago, I was a mystery shopper in New York City when I was an artist and I would go around pretending to be, pretending to be people who I wasn't to try to you know, judge how an organization ran and how a business ran. And for a few weeks, I went around to investors and investment firms to, and pretended to be someone who had all this money 
And then I would solicit their investment tips. Wow. And this is several years ago, I was down at Wall Street and this investment firm was like, you should invest in tobacco stocks. And I was like taking notes. This is me playing. I'm like, oh, okay, why tobacco stocks? He's like, this isn't the stocks for the tobacco company. These are the stocks and the bonds created by the states after they got the settlement for the tobacco company. So rather than give a handout to the cancer victims and families of cancer victims by the tobacco users, a lot of states like Pennsylvania and Michigan created these funds where they took it, they put it on the stock market, and then they used the dividend from that to investors. Now it sounds like- Disaster capitalism. It was disaster capitalism. It sounds like a great idea because the returns were 10 to 15%. And in my mind, I go, that's too good to be true. That's Bernie Madoff level Mm -hmm. returns that you don't get returns like that on a bond. And of course, it did turn out too good to be true. So what happened is Wall Street, all that money for cancer patients and got people like the fake me, who was the rich investor, to pay into these. And then the cancer victims ended up with nothing. And then Wall Street created these fake bonds, tricked the state like Pennsylvania and Michigan to put all their settlement money from Philip Morris into these funds and then took it. And so that's the the awful side of disaster capitalism, disaster con capitalism. Uh, Aaron, um, you also, your work uh, uh, deals with systems, thinking in systems, uh, how we are forced to work in systems, how we are reacting to structures that were there before us. Um, and um, meanwhile, we are asked to create new, new forms, new structures and uh, to be part of change. Um, how are you experiencing the moment? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks um, to you, Frank, but also to Melanie and Oren, um, who uh, I am so loving being a listener on this conversation that I'm going to try to like not be super awkward when I talk, because um, you've both been incredibly articulate, and I like what both of you are saying so much. So I'm thinking in terms of drawing something from what Melanie said, like there's a, um, I got her email and I thought of all the people that like literally on a very like on the ground level, like in the 10 years that I worked at restaurants, the people who, when I went through a long illness and I was working at Angelica Kitchen on 12th street, kept me fed. Like they literally kept me fed. So I was like, well, it's my job to keep them fed. Like the pay it back or pay it, pay it sideways makes total sense. Um, on a more macro level, what I like about this campaign and one, I'm also gonna paste something into chat. So uh, an equivalent for me is um, I got asked to be a mentor for uh, something, the the Center for Arts Activism is doing a really cool campaign um, where they're trying to ensure that when there's an eventual vaccine, that that vaccine is free to the end user, affordable to the people who are gonna pay for it, right? So like a government is gonna pay for it ideally to give to its citizens for free. Um, right? That's not something that is going to happen automatically at all. Um, and then that it's available to everyone on the planet, because that's the only way a vaccine like that is going to be useful. And they're modeling it on Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk had um, this great quote that's when they asked him whether he was going to patent his vaccine, he was like, why? That's like patenting this sun. Why would I do that? So I'm working uh, and I'm giving some time to the Center for Arts Activism, but like an hour a week. They asked me to be a mentor because they were like, oh, you're creative. You have these creative strategies addressing politics and kind of the formal aspects of politics. So I was like, cool, that is a world I want to see, right? Like they have people from 27 countries on board and we're learning about like arts activism in Senegal that uses news media and hip hop to create social change. And I'm like, really all about that. Like I'm getting more than I'm giving. I'm also not doing that as a full-time job because I can't, because I do believe that our jobs as creators as artists are to think through these systemic changes that are happening like on the street right now in the world right now in politics right now we're in the middle of something we can't see the end of and then to envision what possible chances we might have and melanie and i have talked about this to embody the values we want to re-emerge into so what um, are you thinking about? You say um, you use your time thinking. What do you think about? <laughs> um, I'm thinking about, well, just in listening to Oren and Melanie, I'm thinking about how I want to, I'm thinking that I desire to be a part of aid. And I'm really interested in hearing how other artists are thinking about aid. And like Oren, and I'm thinking about how these two tracks that we're on as makers who are part of a system that has massive inequities and also opportunities exist together, right? So 
as soon or as soon as you spoke, I was like, right. I remember when I had um, for two years, I had a, a, an academic fellowship and I had a couple of other freelance gigs that were really well paid. And all of a sudden I was middle class. I could be like, hun, call a babysitter. Let's see a movie. And that's like a that's like a middle class thing that I know that middle class people do, but I'd never been able to do it. And it very quickly made it hard for me to empathize with people who were struggling. Like just for that day, it was difficult for me to empathize just for a little bit. And then I became aware of it, right? So doing a kind of, then I became aware like, wow, I've gotten a little less sensitive as I've gotten more invested in a system that perpetrates these particular inequities that I've been on the other end of for a long time in different ways, right? I've uh, kind of ridden different levels of brokenness and comfort in my life. Um, and so I'm thinking about how do we maintain the awareness of what we want to make when we leave these apartments that we're in or these situations that we're in? How do we understand the system that we're playing in now? How do we, as Oren's talking about, use it um, or at least understand how it is being used and then really start to write down ideas about what we want to move forward toward. So I'm thinking about like, but honestly, I want to say too, like some of my work as an artist is about investigating the form of citizenship or forms of citizenship, who gets asked to be a citizen, how, who gets told they are welcome in the chambers of power. Um, and so I'm interested in making artworks that ask more of us to be engaged as citizens that think of activism as citizenship, not just running for an office. Um, and I'm interested too in this moment politically, because I think, you know, six months ago, you could not say that universal basic income was a viable issue that any major party candidate could even speak about. And I think you can speak about it now, as many of us are homeschooling our kids and recognizing that domestic labor is labor that should be monetized and that universal basic income contributes to that. Um, so like, I don't know what the theater I want to make is about that. I know that some of the work I've been doing um, with my Perfect City project is about like the leaders are people who have not been asked to be leaders before. Um, it's very hard to know what art I want to make and if it's theater. So I have to say, like I, I think, um, and I'm trying now as we've been here for a month to think through how we want our field to embrace the bodies that we want to about, uh, uh, embrace the values that we embody as individuals, because I don't think it's always done that. Um, and I'm curious about that, but I'm thinking more, I'm still thinking of the systems, I guess that's a little bit of a ramble. Um, mm. I think that, I think that um, I watched this really interesting, I've told Aaron about it. I watched this really interesting um, town meeting that was hosted by the rising majority um, featuring Naomi Klein and Angela Davis, which was really a powerful um, thing to attend. And um, I, I think about in particular, and I wrote to these gentlemen saying this myself, like I want to, I want to look at these times and see what they're asking of us. Because if, if it's just a matter of once this over, we're just going to go back to as long as we can get back to what we were doing, get back to what we were doing. Nah, -uh. getting back to you know, I've been, I've been in, a radicalizing myself for my whole entire life, <laughs> and I've been, tr you know, trying to say the status. Quo, I've been trying to convince people the mm -hmm. status quo is the problem, actually. <laughs> So now we have this moment, I think, to really stretch our imagination, our radical imagination as artists, and to think about what, what you know, how do we kick the door? Somebody said, I think it was Naomi, I'm not sure. How do we kick the door of possibility open as wide and for as long mm -hmm. as possible? And let's face it, we wouldn't have had a Bernie or an Elizabeth Warren, if there hadn't been a huge grassroots movement for them to ride in on. There is so much going on in this country and in this world that is really inspiring. There's alternative economic structures, there's alternative healthcare structures. It's something that the foundries, you know, explored for 25 years and, and shared with people. And now here we are. And 
you know, Naomi Klein wrote a really fabulous book a while back about this called shock, I think it was called the shock doctrine about disaster capitalism. And she quotes, I'm going to read you something because it was just so incredible in her book. In that book, she quotes Milton Friedman <laughs> of all the economists for her to quote. And it's the opening quote. And he said, only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. And when the crisis occurs, it depends on what ideas are lying around. And so she went on to discuss in this town meeting that the reason that Friedman was focusing on having an infrastructure for disaster capitalism for the right, for corporations, is because he understood that when capitalism produces its own crisis, which let's face it, that's partly what's happening here, okay? then it, he understands that the left or the progressives or whatever you want to call people who are thinking and making alternative structures, it's a huge opportunity for the left. And he actually wrote a letter, I think it was in 74, 75, I haven't looked it up to be sure. He wrote a letter to Pinochet in Chile. And he said, the thing that's wrong with your country and with my, the thing that went wrong with Chile, like before you became the dictator, and what's wrong with my country had took place in the 30s. Well, what happened in the 30s? I mean, it's kind of what we want to be happening now. It's kind of what, you know, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders isn't a socialist, he's an FDR progressive. He never talked about nationalizing anything. He never, you know, he's, he, anyway. So I do think that this is a time to really take advantage instead of disaster, before disaster capitalism takes advantage and, and packages whatever anyone can invest in to the detriment of other people. I, I, I think we have to, think about the opportunity that this moment offers us to really invest and to really explore the kind of radical change that is that we do or don't want. I mean, the other question is, uh, you know, our, yeah, I'll just stop it there. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Maybe Oran, um, as a question, I know you also write for This Is Us or This Is US, um, which took a pulse of the time. Is there, is, is this, is something happening? Will this be a time of change? Will people be radicalized? As uh, Melanie said, will well, there be real change? Too far. <laughs> um, I, I don't think so, because in America, we're too invested in the paradigm, even though it doesn't work. Hmm. And uh, we're invested in the paradigm because it was created along tribalism and it's very effective. There's a reason why Mississippi is last in education and healthcare for like 50 years in a row. Why do white people in Mississippi keep voting for the same people when they are last in the entire country and at the level of a third world of a third world nation in health Except, and wellness? Pardon and me, but you know, if you look at Mississippi, if you look at what they're doing in terms of the solidarity economy movement that's growing there, it's pretty extraordinary. And I want to tell you, Oren, everyone in the world is writing articles about them except people in this country. Well, look at the South in general. When you look at the South, when you look at these areas in the middle of the country that are, they have pretty bad health care, they have pretty bad education, they have pretty bad supplies, the answers are known of what to do. People don't want to do it and don't want to vote for it. So then I go, why don't they want to vote for it? And it goes back to tribalism. And yes, part of that is the, the original sin tribalism of this country having to do with race. And it's very, very, very effective. And it's effective in transferring over from black people to Mexicans to Arabs and after 9-11. It's a very effective switch to get people to vote against their own interests, to vote against their own children's interests and in health and even their life. And so what I think is gonna happen when this, when this crisis uh, explodes or peaks and begins to go down is that uh, Fox News and all those people will just pivot to finding the scapegoat that gets people re-entrenched in their tribal viewpoints. But and those same people that, that voted against it. Can, are you saying? We I, just, can I pipe in? I'm not saying there's nothing we could do. I'm saying addressing the problem on the surface of we need this health care. And it's like, we all know what we need as far as health care. We have a terrible health care system. We have chosen this health care system. 
We have chosen an education system. So why do we keep making these choices that hurt us? There is a root to all of these different problems that unless we address it, we are gonna be playing whack-a-mole with the environment, care with education. And a lot of the times what I see in the arts and progressive movement is that's what we're doing. We're playing whack-a-mole and we're exhausting ourselves and we're exhausting our well, energy. I say the yeah, let's say Aaron, I think Aaron wanted to make a comment. Aaron, jump in. Um, well, one thing I would say is, uh, so there's a great quote. I don't know if people read Nonprofit as Fuck by Vu Lee. Um, it's a really, really great blog about how the nonprofit industrial complex perpetuates a lot of the problems it purports to want to serve. And he's talking about, which I think I'm hoping this brings together the two of you in a way. I mean, the, what the two of you are saying, I think we're together, right? But like, um, he talks about how we on the left or in the nonprofit sector or who we identify as progressives become really good at uh, helping out in a crisis. And then the right comes in with the next crisis. So we're here like giving, we're doing, I'm doing like some really fun stuff with my friend Flacco and Bushwick. We're trying to figure out how to get masks and sanitizer into the right hands. The people who really don't have access to the internet. That feels great. But the right is meanwhile, like installing another judge, right? Like we do all these great campaigns and they get yeah. bread. Right. So one thing I want to say, listening to both of you is like, it is like we are prefigured, we are hoping to envision what's possible. Um, and the, the, the counter force is already happening. Like that, they're, both of those things are evolving at once. Like yeah. they're, the, the stimulus package is pathetic if you're a single user and great if you're a corporation. The idea of, of getting rid of the post office is about keeping us from voting to continue the original inequities that founded the country that I, I think Oren is talking about, the, the land, the, clon the settler colonialism, the enslavement, right? So this is just a perpetuation of that that's trying to be done on a national scale, while at the same time, some of us are trying to go like, oh, what is this other thing we want to enter into? I went on a scary, like, I give myself, like, I literally put a timer on when I go down a Twitter hole of like, I'm gonna see what the other side thinks, which is, I don't necessarily recommend it, but I don't not, because <laughs> like, after that outburst uh, by Trump at his briefing where the journalist kind of finally held him to account, the entire alt-right Twitter was like, he owned the libs. Like that yeah. was what happened. So there are people that are equally entrenched in the points of view that are, as I see them, destructive as we may be desperate to prefigure. One thing I wanna just throw out maybe, and I'm, it, don't take it up or take it up, but I've been really, before we all went home and stayed home, I was really interested in the subject or the, I was think, tossing around this phrase of like culture as survival or culture is survival. Um, and I think there's, it's just on my mind, which is it has to do on some kind of deep level with like putting us back together with the public sector that we originally came from, right? Like library, schools, culture, they feel equally important, food, land, um, housing. Um, but Frank, when you ask the question about what am I thinking about creatively, I think about culture as survival um, and literally as survival, the survival of people who have been enslaved, the stories and songs. Um, and then also on a really scary way, the Charlottesville March a couple of years ago was culture as it was trying to preserve the survival of a culture, a culture that has been dominant for so long. And people, I think, got a glimpse that it was scary. Um, that they might not survive or that there was a chance they wouldn't. So that's what that was. For, for me, this is just that moment where we're thinking about what culture as survival means. That's what I'm thinking about a lot. And on culture note, that is the issue that the right and disaster capitalism has over us. They've created a lifestyle. We talk about issues. They talk about a lifestyle choice. And this lifestyle choice was created in the 60s in the midst of rebelling against the hippie movement and has consistently worked for the last 60 to 70 years in most of the, most of the states in the middle of the country. And it's the four or five Fs, flags, fetuses, firearms, and the F word for gay people is what they depend on. And they sell that with a Bible and a cross. I'm not saying it's right, but it is a very strong, easy to identify lifestyle choice. And Marilyn sure. Robinson's mean, After Adam essay addressed the death of the progressive movement happened in the 60s because the progressive movement from abolition to the 60s was attached to a spirituality and it created a lifestyle choice. Being a left-wing person was attached to who you were on Sunday through Saturday. And after the 60s, the, the, the left became less spiritual and the churches in New York mm -hmm. City and in Boston started dying. 
and the progressive movement, well-intentioned, became more political and more atheistic. And then the lifestyle choice sort of split up and it just became a matter of different issues rather than this is how you should live your life. And we need to create a left-wing progressive new choice as far as a lifestyle. This is how we view the world holistically, not just issue by issue, not disaster by issue. How do you then, how do you, how do you look at the resurgence in the last 50 years of the grassroots movement and their own uh, self-determinating power and their own, um, and their sort of intersectional understanding of this movement? And I mean, for example, I, when I went to that Zoom town meeting, there were 20, they had to shut it down because there were 20,000 um, viewers or 25, whatever is the max that Zoom allows. And more than half of them from, were from around the world. And this, and when I used to go to the World Social Forum, you know, there were 186,000 people representing people from all over the world. Some came in bare feet for fuck's sake. I mean, so how do you, how, I, and I ask this genuinely, trying yeah. not to be like, how do you, but really how do you metabolize those millions and millions of people that have been building for 50 years? No kidding. I mean, when I, I'll just say one more thing. When I started the foundry in 94, it, I didn't even know this. I found out when I was working on the book. At that time, the, there was a huge proliferation of community-based organizations in New York City. One after a number were all coming up in the early 90s. This is the result of a lot of work that has been going on before that. But it, it, you know, now the, the social justice organizations in New York, it's a thrilling world of people and communities and and so anyway, how do you I, mean, I posted that? this on Facebook where I was in Williamsburg doing my laundry, mostly <laughs> Latino and black people there late at night on Friday and the democratic debates were on. And every time Bernie Sanders spoke, everyone sort of was pausing. You could hear it quiet down. They were listening to what he was saying. He was tapping into something that spoke to people. And then I come down here to Miami and Miami is less concentrated. Uh, it's a little bit older. And all I heard was from Democrats, oh my God, we can't get Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Please not Bernie Sanders. And so sometimes I realize my New York progressive view isn't held even by liberal centrists in the middle of the country and other, other areas. I could tell them, look, black and Latino people were enraptured by what he was saying on the TV. And they'll say, they're not gonna vote or they're gonna vote unreliably, or they're gonna vote in a crisis. And then two years later in the midterm elections, the Democrats are gonna get slaughtered, which is typically what happens when a democratic president is in office. People get excited on the charisma of Obama. And two years later, the Democrats lose everything because yeah. it's not consistently focused. Mm -hmm. People are really great and the left wing is, has a really good heart and it comes out when there is, like Aaron said, a crisis or when there's a tragedy, we, you have a disaster thing, but then how do you sustain that beyond again. it? I have to ask you this question again, because number one, do not think that this fundraising campaign in any way is my activism. It's not, it's an no, it's obvious not. thing to do and it'll happen. Uh, there are way bigger things or different kinds of ways that I can engage myself. This is one. That said, what I don't think there would have been an Elizabeth Warren or a Bernie Sanders if, there, if they didn't have a movement to ride in on. And there certainly wouldn't be the squad in, in, in Congress if there wasn't a movement for them to ride in on. And I don't think it's just New York, my God. In fact, New York is the smaller of, of the congregations of, of community-based organizations. There's more in the South, there's more in Detroit, there's more in, in, believe it or not, in Mississippi and so, and in, and in Chicago. And so, I mean, I, what do we do? Do we just, I mean, how do we, align ourselves with that in a way that makes us feel that there is possibility because these folks have can show you it's the reason i went to the you know the kids that i went to to give this money to is because the possibility in their bodies is extraordinary yeah and i don't think one 
negates the other. Like I said, I give on multiple levels. I give to the person mm. on the street, I give to the charity, and then I give to philanthropy to build long term. And but I think you have to give to I'm multiple levels. Following, I'm saying working with, I'm saying aligning with. Forget it, giving is easy. Giving is easy for money, but there's other types of giving, which is we have to create a system that cr that gives people a actual lifestyle that they can attach to when there's a crisis and when there's not that they can go to that motivate vote. The other side is motivated because they think of fetuses and firearms and flags. What what is our three or four RGs? What are our things that are stanchion that people can go back to again and again? tell their children, repeat it again and again in a caucus when you, it depends upon enthusiasm. When I looked at the 2016 caucus or the Republicans, they had representative for different campaigns. And Ben Carson's campaign dead. Scott Walker talked about jobs in this vague way. Jeb Bush talked about experience, which, you know, puts me to sleep. And then Trump's guy stood up and he said he wants to build. Mexico's wait, 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 you just cut out. What? He, he wants to build a wall. Mexico's going to pay for it. Bring in coal back. Now, I knew all of this was 100%. It was a con. But this armor in Iowa could stand up and repeat five points out of the blue that no other person representing their candidate could. And that's the special thing about a caucus. And when it came time to vote, this is back when everyone... Trump was a joke and didn't have a chance. So we're watching this on Brain Dead. We saw the pile of Jeb Bush's votes, which was scribbled out. We saw the pile of Scott Walker's votes. And then we saw the mountain of Trump votes, of people who had scribbled Trump in, because it attached to a basic foundation that was, that was underneath, rooted in something. Mm -hmm. It was rooted in their fear. It was rooted in hatred. It was rooted in whatever they wanted, their nostalgia. What are we rooting things in? Unfortunately, fear is an automatic... Uh, thing that motivates people but could some of could some version of like some other version that lasts longer be a motivating tool for the left that gets people to stand up and say this elizabeth one wants this 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 and this or stacy adams well, wants I, this I, more Aaron, like you do Aaron. i mean i would say i think part of the answer this is like slightly it's a uh, my own cliche here but i mean part of the answer is local i mean it's attaching local concerns, issues, subjects to something like a larger narrative. And you could call the larger narrative a spiritual one, right? Like the, the four Fs, uh, or you could call it um, an, a creative one or a metaphor, whatever it is. But I think that there, you know, it is possible to get a city, you, you can win a, a city council seat on the Lower East Side where I live by 2000 votes, right? And so that means there are certain strategies you can use to change the conversation in a locality. And if that's tied to something that is both bread and butter for people who live there and also connected to something larger on a national or international level, I think that's part of the strategy. You know, I think, um, uh, so I mean, I, I feel like I'm seeing that a little bit and maybe that is what the organizing that allowed someone like Sanders, um, allowed someone like AOC, allowed someone like Warren to have a platform at all was connected to local grassroots organizing. Absolutely. Because I think the folks in Florida, like I have relatives in Florida um, too, and they're like very center Democrats and super scared of Bernie. And I think I probably can't have the conversation with them, but someone can, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there are really great, there are really great organizations, Generation Citizen. There's like really great organizations that are trying to build creative strategies to get younger people more locally engaged because they can actually, there are places where you know the, the voter turnout for a council election is 10 percent so, so um also there's if, you know what's really great is the deep canvassing organization yeah. that's preparing us for for the election and they're doing really great workshops and i'm going to go work for them in pennsylvania in the fall hopefully and so, uh, yeah the, the, the question is if i hear right you also say in some way the civil war never ended in america it was like a pause button there still that that struggle that we have and this is the next fight it's a big fight we are artists or you are artists and um so what should we do as melanie said earlier what is what is now really demanded of, of artists what do you think an artist should be doing as an artist but also as a human as a person what is the right thing to do everybody is struggling with it so just from you from your answers what do you what do you feel is of significance important what should we be thinking about 
Well, I think that uh, the, one of the most successful movements that's been underrated on the left in the last hundred years was the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party in Chicago was actually one of the first movements that got black people, uh, rednecks from Indiana across, across state lines, all these people marching together for rights under a banner, under some sort of power symbol of a panther that people easily understood. And that's why the police and the FBI killed all those people and assassinated them right. because they realized, oh, if poor white people and black people and these Mexicans get together, this is dangerous. This isn't Martin Luther King, which is dangerous, but we can handle it because we can dilute it and we can change Martin Luther King's message and just pretend like it's our own, like we do for Jesus and everything we sort of like take over. But this is dangerous because it's going to wake white people up. And so that all those leaders, but that movement and the style of leadership, the rainbow coalition that Jesse Jackson used, it became the coalition got the first black mayor elected in Chicago and broke up the daily system. It became the system that Obama's advisors used in 2008. And this thing that was like, this is when they get scared when you actually start bringing these different people together under a strong, simple, and clear message that people can understand. And that is what consistently has worked. Now, I am, I am someone who's both a progressive and a pragmatic, and these are also the gray areas. The first election I paid to in 92, I was, and the thing I, the person I love was Paul Songas. And I remember turning on the TV one time and C-SPAN had, a governor from Arkansas speaking, announcing that he was running for president. <laughs> and I was like looking at him and I thought two things. Number one, I don't know this guy, but whatever he's saying, I can feel in my bones he's lying to me. Number two, I like him. And those two thoughts ran on parallel tracks while I was listening to Bill Clinton talk. And I was like, he's lying, but for some reason I'm kind of okay with that right now. Still gonna support Paul Sanders. He lost. 2004, Howard Dean all the way, he lost. Two, I like again and again, I picked the losing candidate because I lead with my heart. And at the same time, when it comes time for the general election, I vote for the moderate because I realize. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I think we, we. What happened? Oh, we lost him and uh, he might be frozen. Maybe Aaron, if you can hear us, put your video off and just have the sound. But maybe the question okay. to Aaron. We lost um, you on, I vote for the moderate is where it's oh, stopped. you can hear me? I just said, that was pretty much it. I vote for the moderate, but at the same time, my heart's with the more progressive movement. And I think it requires some pragmatism and maybe some deception where you have this clear, simple message. Because when Clinton tried to explain healthcare in the 90s, people were like, this is confusing to me. So you need to have a clear, simple message. And then mm -hmm. you have to fudge it when it comes down to actually executing it. So you're mm -hmm. saying we see the leader, <clears throat> leadership system like a Black Panther and a very clear message people will be able to connect to and artists should be part of that. Aaron, what's your- Yeah, um, I mean, just to add, to build on that, you know, the Panthers and the Young Lords is exactly what people are doing when they do mutual aid networks, which are popping up all over the world right now. So that is like, and, and hopefully most many of them are recognizing the lineage. I would also say ACT UP, you know, the, the Center for Arts Activism is using ACT UP strategies. And in terms of to the point that Aaron made about messaging and simplicity silence equals death was a thing and an image and a phrase that you know really had valence that had these really incredible outcomes like powerful outcomes for everybody right the reason we're going to get a COVID-19 vaccine in eight months to 16 months as opposed to 10 years is because partly because of some of the act up activism that happened no around question. AZT no. so I mean I guess maybe as artists we should be looking for ways we can both attach to programs that have a historic resonance and work now, and then also perhaps allowing ourselves to try to find those messages and images. Like the, the, the pink triangle is really like emblazoned as someone who arrived in New York in 1987, like that was something that changed the world, right? That changed the world in positive ways. So I think it's, yeah, let's all leave it at that. Huh. Can you ask the question again, Frank? Looking at you who have done 25 years of extraordinary work uh, in an artistic aesthetic way, which is important to you, but also in a very political way, socially engaged with an ethical and moral um, impetus. Right now, you know, you and your apartment where you are in New York City, what, what do you feel 
what is the thing we should be doing, should be thinking most about? What is of significance right now? I feel like this is, I really feel like this is a moment in which we can think about reset. I really do. And, and I feel that, you know, how that operates in my own community, such as it is, um, the idea of being able to return to exactly what they were doing, I think is not only a missed opportunity, but I, well, it's primarily a missed opportunity, but I also think it's, um, it deadens our, our radical potential as artists, as makers, let alone as political, as political animals. And um, I would say that I really feel we're not done. Disaster capitalism is perched like crazy right now. Okay. And it's, it's, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot being set up even now. And I feel if we don't fight for, you know, single payer health care, if we don't support demand that um, that Biden stand up for some of these changes as Bernie is going to do, I believe. I believe it's in our, um, we, are we are artists in the world. We don't only make art, we make the world. And I think that in many ways, what's liberal about us gets in the way of of our greater participation as, as in, in our hearts as progressives. And I feel in the same way that I hope we don't return to making the exact same theater in exactly the same place as if it was a frozen moment. I hope we don't continue to be um, stuck and afraid of, of this moment being something that, that allows us to participate in a reset. There's a lot of people working on it and they need us. Yeah. And um, are you guys, as a, maybe we are get, coming close to it and it was a very significant political discussion we had today. And, and, but, but on the artistic world, what are you working on? Is there something you do engage? Do you do journals? Do you write or do you write on screenplays? Uh, Melanie, do you? think about uh, production, Aaron, um, um, are you conceptually working on things to do or is that not the right moment? But how, what's, what's on your mind? I mean, I'm working with the understanding that again, because we are on this, like I agree with the word reset and I feel like we are kind of on this precipice of what we reemerge into that I'm working on what I was working on, which is like a very intimate chamber theater piece about insomnia as a superpower and unspoken framings that make us behave in certain ways. And I'm also like, I don't know what that's gonna mean a year from now or a year and a half mm -hmm. from now. So I'm thinking about like, what's the raw material of what I normally put into creative work and putting a little bit of a hold on it and just trying to imagine it from this place. So that's one thing I'm doing. And then, um, you know, I just get up in the morning and I also have a meditation practice that's based in Buddhism and I sit and then I put the coffee on and then as I'm putting the coffee on I write a single journal page we like and there's always like this is personal this is work and there's a ton of lists in there um, and so I think that's where I'm at. Thank you. All right. I am working on the second season of the CBS show Evil. Uh, super producer and then on the Zoom now and probably the near future. And then in the mornings and the evening, I am uh, working on a play commission, uh, examining the term we talked about uh, through the lens of the OJ trial when I was in high school. And I remember I had, I'm not gonna get into it, but a very strange experience because I didn't care at all about the trial, but everyone around me did. And so I soaked in these different strains of divisions that people had. Uh, and I had a very weird schedule in high school where I would come home, go to sleep immediately, wake up at 1 or 2 a.m. and do homework all the way to the start of work because that allowed me silence. 
So usually I had the TV on to the news and I would just do my homework to the news in the middle of the night when people were asleep. Anyway, so I'm working on a TV show, the OJ play for Miami New Drama, and then uh, possibly a few movies that I'm working on with dealing with, you know, Black people getting out of prison and justice, remember all these other things that we've been talking about for 20, 30 years, and then trying to explore uh, what are the canaries in the mind for the Black community, because whatever happens to us is going to happen to the rest of the country 10 years, 20 years later. And on the meditation front, I meditate every day, and I'm producing meditation videos uh, for Limitless Health Institute. Uh, we have the first three or four out, and it was an idea uh, that I suggested because I was listening to another 20 day Deepak Chopra meditation challenge, like in yeah. February, <laughs> I ended that and many other people were doing, I ended that. And I thought, what if we could do something that was actually a Buddhist principles, seven or 10 that people could do over now that we're all in quarantine and you could do one a week. It focuses on compassion. It focuses on honoring kindness, like what people are doing every day at seven in New York city. Like that is actually important. It seems small, but honoring kindness, celebrating, being happy, banging, banging a drum for the healthcare workers does something, not only to the healthcare workers, but it triggers a ripple effect that is going to help us recover as society better. So trying to give money, but also give those resources, because money, as Melanie said, is the easiest thing to give. And I try to give it, but it's about resources beyond money, which is creating those lifestyles, creating those movements that Melanie's doing, that Aaron's doing, and creating the artwork that then can last beyond the crisis and, and influence people's lives down the road to possibly avert another crisis 10 years from now, like we could have done in 2012 or 2014. Right. We were warned about right. this. That's yeah. right. Melanie, what, That's what's... Right. Um, I write every morning, even and similar to Aaron. Like, I usually have three... Um, three pages. Um, one is what I'm going to try to do today. <laughs> and the other is personal, like journaling. And then the other is some sort of attention to, to material that I'm working on writing, whether that's an essay or in my, I, I'm working on both on essays and also um, two theatrical pieces that may or may not do something. But like Aaron, for me, those are just, if I don't do those things, or at least sit in front of them, um, I fear uh, I, I have to do them. But that said, none of them are satisfying me as material for going forward just yet. I'm, I feel I need to live through this time mm -hmm. a little bit more to understand if I have anything to say about it or to ask about it that, um, that I'd like to invite people to partake in. Um, the only thing I am doing that's giving me a lot of joy creatively is that I, I read out loud. I started reading out loud to myself. Um, a while, I, I, you know, I live by myself in my little apartment and I read out loud because friends of mine like me to read to them and so I pretend they're here and I read to them. And then I started recording them. So I've been reading Salinger stories and um, sending them to people who want them. And um, so I recently just did for uh, yesterday, I did for Esme with Love and Squalor. Mm. So that's giving me a lot of pleasure to read some short stories out loud and think about sharing them with people. Wonderful. That I feel I can do. Maybe put them up on the Foundry uh, web website. So um, this was, I think, a significant uh, conversation and different in the tone from all the other ones. And I think it is a time to think about the political, <laughs> about uh, uh, changes, about the system that produced this. And now the same system that tells us to stay at home, you know, and uh, doesn't can produce 50 cents. May marks. I ask you a question before we part? Yeah. Do you find it unusual or odd or notable that you've had all of these conversations with artists for these weeks and there hasn't been any political discussion? How do you interpret mm -hmm. that? Um, I think um, we had them, they were part of it. Um, of course, also, as you know, the Siegel Center, you know, we feel art is significant. We feel that producing art 
uh, is uh, of importance that the aesthetics of art do matter. And um, so of course, artists, we asked them about their life, their daily life, and they immediately affected also in the moment and people are still under a shock. Thomas Ostermeyer from Berlin says, it's like a bus run over me, I can't think. But we know what's wrong with this system. We, this is not the fight, the fight will be after this is over. Like the people in Hong Kong, we said, you think this is complicated? Wait till this is over and we have to go out again, you know? And um, so it was never on the same, so it might have also be my, uh, our, our um, ideas of, of the talks, but I also think it's changing perhaps in the mood, you know, that from being shocked, motionless of thinking and then becoming and doing something to act, as you say, to act up, maybe there is also after three, four weeks, some change um, in the air. And, um, and I also do think uh, theater is a house and performance and it has many, many rooms. And one room is the political and one room is the aesthetical. But perhaps right now, uh, we all do think we have to be part of the change. We have to be we want to see and we have to act and we have to point out what's wrong also for the people who come after us and for the people we had black fest here and the playwright said you know our family members are preparing their wills they're sitting together you know families support each other you have to witness that we don't know what to do we don't have money we don't have uh, uh, jobs we don't have uh, health care you know we don't have our lawyers we it's that kind of an end of time that happened for hundreds of years for our community the disenfranchised and um, so um it is a moment where we have to do that, but also do think that the art is what makes it, what we miss now, what isn't life is what the arts is about. And we always also feel it's part of it, but the political um, of course is always um, on our mind. So um, thank you for, for, for being there, staying with us. I think it was a very significant, important discussion. I hope you guys might be able to join in, uh, uh, in today. After today, we have uh, Shaheen Nadim from Pakistan and uh, and Abhishek Mumba from India will tell what it means in their countries. Also, those two countries, they have that complicated relation, but they are friends to hear what is the situation for artists there, the complications as we heard in Lebanon for people who cannot even, the wrong Facebook post, will you put you in jail and your life in danger already? So they have already life-threatening conditions and now they are in their homes confined. Um, and then on uh, Friday, we have uh, Gregos Jajina and uh, the Tia Varsova, a company that tries to uh, work under a political authoritarian system that is now uh, uh, censoring shows. The show, the Kafka show couldn't come uh, from, from, uh, from Christian Lupa, couldn't come to New York, you know, they took from the money back. Uh, from Varsova in Poland, Tia Varsova, and with uh, Agata Kolzas and Roman Pavlovsky, who are part of that great significant company. They have to be to be with us at St. Dan's and already at BAM. And uh, now they have to struggle. They are about to build a new theater and they say, what does that mean now in the digital time where we are now, but also political, how will they survive? It's the only kind of free city in Poland um, that still in a way have artistic control over their work and uh, because they have a different mayor. So um, we have an, an overview and of course, Melanie, you also with your work has been always so close to the political and then this is why we felt to have you here of importance so thank you all for joining we went a little bit over time i hope hal Round will forgive us and um but uh, it is uh, as always we always interrupt it and we will always be over time and things take longer but really thank you and thank you for our listeners and know how much is out there how much content is out there how busy your lives are even if you are at home so it means a lot we need these discussions, but we also need to, someone to listen and uh, to make sense out of it. And uh, we hope we make a small uh, contribution here from the Siegel Center. And next week, as I said, we have a, another lineup. Stay tuned and um, thank you for joining and taking your time. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Frank. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, too. Thanks, thank you. Bye-bye. And see you all soon for a drink, I hope. I hope. <laughs>